picture this scene. It's the American West. Fields of corn, as far as you can see. Sunset through the dust. Maybe a steel windmill creaking in the distance. And maybe there's a man in this picture. Maybe he's tending to his fields, thinking over his life, chewing over some inner battles that won't leave him be. That guy is Steve Von Till. Coyotes call in a dark wood I could have sworn They called my name He's the guy you'll most likely know from Neurosis, probably one of the single heaviest bands to have ever turned the sounds of the apocalypse into their own form of metal. But he's also had a side project of his own these last 15 years. It's basically just him with music stripped right back to its absolute bare essentials. He's got a new album out, it's called A Life Unto Itself, and it is incredible. Now, I've been a fan of Steve Von Till's solo stuff for a long time, and I thought this would be a good chance to track him down, because I've always kind of been curious to find out what's really going on in that head of his, because he, he just seems like such an intense guy. So I wanted to get into his head. So that's what I've done. This is the Metal Ireland Podcast, number 18. Now, as ever, before we start, I want to give a shout out to people that we think are cool. This time, it's Farmageddon Brewing Co-op in Northern Ireland. They're making incredible ales at the minute. Their best one that I think so anyway is their white IPA. It's a bit more sort of grapefruity, a bit more citrusy than a typical IPA. And it's not as heavy. It's only about 3.8% or something like that. So it's a bit lighter if you're sort of drinking a lot of them, um, which you really will want to after tasting this one. Um, they're great. They're a great brewing co-op, and you should check out the rails. They're only small. You know, they could do with a bit of a, a push. So that's what we want to give them. Anyway, they're really high quality. And uh, I'm drinking them a lot lately, and they're, they're really quite delicious. I know a lot of you guys are into rails, so check Farmageddon out. Anyway, on we go with the interview. Now, everyone knows Steve Von Till because of Neurosis, the ferociously heavy band that were the sound to total urban decay in the 90s and 2000s. So I suppose what I first wanted to know is how he changed from that kind of imagery to the stuff he's doing now, because this is what he used to sound like. image of what we were trying to uh, paint uh, it was just the expression that we felt driven to uh, get out as angst ridden teenagers uh, you know in, in the urban environment you know uh, but at the same time there was always hints of something more I don't know, um, psychological, something deeper, something going more inward than simply reflecting, you know, uh, urban decay or, or industrialism or, or anything like that. I think it was always about being a thinking, feeling human being within your environment. And I think, uh, as much as it had to do with whatever our surroundings were, because that's what was affecting us. It also had to do always with our relationship with with nature, both as uh, individuals, but primarily as a species. You, you know, you had this huge, huge, uh, sonically massive music um, that did reflect very much the you know the the urban and the built environment. And what was it that made you? move back from that and what what happened in your head that you decided you needed to strip it all right back <clears throat> the initial inspiration was quite accidental uh, I, I was living in San Francisco you know in a small flat in the, uh, and it's such a beehive of a city you know it's not very big land area wise but there's so many people crammed into a small space um that it was hard to find moments of, of peace and quiet and you know as a young man being surrounded by that many inspired 
artists and you know shit going on was very exciting but at the same time there there's this constant restlessness that it was hard to find peace in and uh i had some home recording equipment you know in in my in my bedroom and uh it was an old house and kind of a nice sounding room high ceilings and wood floors and um you know, I just started playing these acoustic-based songs, you know, three or four in the morning when everybody else in the house and the other flats and were asleep and things were quiet out on the street for a change. And uh, after a few years, I, I just realized that I had this body of work that what didn't belong anywhere else. It wasn't experimental electronic kind of droney tribes of neurot stuff it wasn't ideas that i could take to the neurosis guys it was uh it was my Down own breaks. private quiet self-reflective the moment caught on tape of civilization when our island sinks in the sea Songs of the siren will lure us down. Ashes, ashes. We I never envisioned having a project under my own name. In fact, it was difficult to come to grips with at first. Like, seemed very egocentric to want to, you know, put out uh, solo music under my own name. But, but it was something I really needed to get off my chest and off my shoulders and, and out of my out of my body. You know, something that needed to come to light. And uh, so I'm glad I did because then. After that first step, it was clear that okay, I, I can have this uh, other medium with which to express my, you know, innermost kind of quiet moments, uh, still being original and emotionally powerful and still being heavy, but without, um, you know, the volume and and the the, the driven beast that is neurosis that, that takes us in its own kind of ways. And, and uh, it's been a satisfying journey, you know, especially, especially after this last one, I, I, this last one is so important to my psychological well being to have gotten it off my shoulders. I can't even tell you. Yeah. Um, I suppose everybody who listened to as the crow flies, when that came out and I remember it really, really well, um, just the, uh, I, I mean, romance is the wrong word, but one can't help having a romantic view of how that music was created. I mean, you've described it there, you know, in a, in a quiet room, four a.m. when all, when all else is is sort of asleep. I mean, was that music that you just described was that what became as the crow flies? Yeah, almost exactly. I mean, those are the recordings, but taken and fleshed out a little bit after the fact. And I suppose after that, you know, this went on. Um, were you taken aback by how positive the initial response was to As the Crow Flies? Or, or, or did that sort of take time to filter through to you? Yeah, you know, I mean, <clears throat> when you make any kind of strange, odd music like that, you know, you sometimes you, you're you think what a gift it is and what, what, and uh, that, that anybody else cares or even gives a shit. Um, I mean, we even feel that way with neurosis. I mean, you know, we, we, we get enough ego strokes and enough positive feedback to, to know that we have an important place in, in music, but that's all 
secondary, you know, to the fact that we just have to make this music to try to stay sane. And, um, and it's not friendly music and it's not, you know, listener friendly. And so the, and it would, by the, by the same token, you know, my solo music seems so, so odd and so very personal. And, and sometimes I feel like maybe I'm the only one who likes it because it's, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's not, uh, I, I don't know, but it, it, it is, it is extremely, uh, I don't know. I have a lot of gratitude and I'm grateful that anyone else finds anything, um, to relate to in it. You know, I mean, that as a music fan, that's the greatest compliment because I'm that way with music, you know, music saves my life over and over again when I find those albums that speak to me. And, uh, the fact that anyone thinks that of my music is, is incredible. Well, I think one of the things about, particularly as the crow flies, uh, you know, there hadn't been much like that emanating from, you know, metal musicians in the past. And one of the core things about it was its complete simplicity and its absolute directness. And, you know, neurosis were always, or are always, direct, simple, hypnotic, uh, essentials, bare essentials magnified to huge scale. This, as the crow flies, you know, you think of like um, ashes or something. It's it's single strokes, you know, and your voice. How difficult was it to boil it down to that? Or, I mean, did you have an agenda to just start from absolute musical zero in terms of the simplicity of these of these songs, or or did you have to work at it? There, there was no agenda, and actually there wasn't much of a cerebral process. I didn't really, uh, didn't really worry about it. It just, it, that's how it came out. That's just what happened. Um, you know, if there was any agonizing about it, it would be about, you know, my own insecurities afterwards. Like, wow, is that, you know, is that enough? Is that good enough? I don't know. Uh, should I, you know redo it and try to make it grand more grand or but uh you know that's ultimately not was not what was going to serve it i think that was those you know um i i tend to create with my solo stuff now and i can i can say it now that i've done four records that the primary piece of it is that um, it's a guitar and a voice uncomfortably close you know um, like when you hear your own voice reflecting back off the wall when you got your head up against it <laughs> you know <laughs> um, and that's just the fun that's just where it all comes from and a- anything sonically beyond that is kind of uh uh, ear candy to to enhance it yeah it's, well one of the things that always jumped out at me about it was you know it was it, it it's an album that requires complete uh attention i think from from the listener you know you can't just stick it on because even if you tried to just stick it on it draws you in anyway but uh it, you know it really is you know armchair hearth whatever tea whatever uh, exactly. you know, for for sort of con- contemplative and ruminative music, but the the line that I always took out of it was, um, you know, to live free with a quiet mind, and it seems that that is the the desire evident in the whole thing. Actually, <laughs> that's a life desire, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know if I chose the right lifestyle to end up uh, being able to ever achieve that, but. Um, yeah, that's a that that's a deep longing there. That sums up a lot of it. Coyotes go in a dark wood. I could have sworn. 
They called my name The cries bring one to know it That either way It's all the same All the same Much is made of your, you know, apparent um, interest in, you know, ancestry and, and roots and, and all that. But can you put some flesh on the bones there? What, what does that actually mean? Why are you interested in it? And what are you interested in trying to evoke and communicate? It's just kind of a lifelong quest to understand uh, not only me as an individual, but us as a, as a society and a species, you know, to uh, growing up in California at the time I did, you know, America is a country of immigrants, largely. Um, and it's amazing to me how fast people forget where they come from. I mean, very few people here have been here for more than two or three generations, myself included, you know, you just all of a sudden get adopted into this uh, television, Walmart, McDonald's, sports, uh, consumer culture, which is when I was growing up and I'm a teenager and starting to learn some things always and I'm not very political, but it always felt like it's the death of all cultures. Uh, and uh, it's not that there aren't interesting cultural aspects about America, because there absolutely are. I mean, there's a lot of a million great stories here, going back to the very first people who peopled the land, the Native Americans and their, their folk tales and their stories and the stories of all the different uh, immigrations and waves of people that have come here and in search of something better. And, you know, so sometimes I, you know, you reflect on, okay, I'm from the Western United States. This is, it's a young country. It's a young place. It's the, not long ago was the wild West, <laughs> you know, yeah. and some aspects of it still carry that energy. And what is it about this westward expansion of people, uh, starting in the Scythian plains of Europe and the waves of the pre Celts and the waves of the Celts moving West and the waves of the, of the uh, Germanic tribes and the waves of the people after that and, and the Slavic peoples and their, their, their constant movement. Um, it, it must be something deep within all of us that is this search for something greener, something better, you know? And, uh, and for me as a young kid, starting with something really simple as being interested in European folk tales, I Irish mythology, um, Scandinavian mythology, all these stories, um, and seeing pictures of, of stone sites and hill forts and, uh, uh, it was just so intriguing to me as a, as a young, young boy, as a young man. And, uh, so it's always been kind of, it's just about, learning more of it to learn more about myself. I mean, I have a really broad, like a lot of Americans, I have a broad ancestral heritage, you know. Um, I was going to ask, actually, because obviously Von Till, you know, you, one thinks of the sort of Northern European sort of countries there. Yeah, but, you, you know, I heard something interesting on the radio the other day that because Americans are so mixed and so... Uh, um, not aware of their actual, the details of their um, heritage for the most part. Like, people kind of pick and choose <laughs> their, their ancestry. I mean, how many people are, are fucking Irish on St. Patrick's Day who, who maybe have one great grandparent who actually might have been Irish, mm -hmm. you know? It's funny because one, one thinks of uh, Pulp Fiction whenever Butch gets into the cab with the girl and uh, she says, what's your name? 
and he says, my name is Butch. And she says, Butch. And he says, I'm American. Our names don't mean shit, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a... Uh... So, you know, my heritage is quite mixed. I I know more about my father's side, my grandparents. um, My grandmother was Irish Catholic from Brooklyn, New York, and my grandfather was, uh, and she was first generation born in America. Uh, Her father was a a shipbuilder who immigrated to Canada and then the United States. Uh, My grandfather was Hungarian, and his... um, the family immigrated from Budapest and they lived on the kind of uh, Austrian Hungarian kind of, the borders were different then, mm-hmm. but uh, kind of on the border there. And what, what's now, I think the region is called Moravia. Um, so obviously because of the names, they must've been from the German speaking part of that, that area. But it, it's, uh, and then on my mother's side, it's more, uh, uh, English, but very, it's hard to tell because they were early settlers um, to Uh, America. It's interesting because, I mean, the culture that has uh, been sort of interrogated and, you know, yearned for of late, I mean, you'll forgive me for using the word like, um, you know, Americana, Uh, you know, one thinks of Bonnie Prince Billy and stuff like that, but even, you know, that amazing Earth record, Hex, just painted a picture of this, you know, rural American country way of life that in, in much the same way as your you know, more recent albums do. I'm just wondering what it is people are trying to evoke and what they're searching for. Hmm. I think um I think people are searching for connectedness and you've got all these city people looking for some sort of connectedness to the land and um some of the i I mean for myself it's it's been a connectedness to 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 landscape and to to heritage and to but more of a global thing i think americana is maybe just a piece of something i touch on and and maybe it's kind of in me because i am from the west uh but I think some people's influence is literal. Some people have been, you know, reading Cormac McCarthy books and, and getting, uh, you know, um, inspired to try to come up with a soundtrack to these kind of bleak, bleak landscapes. And Yeah, I mean, you uh, think of like Red Sparrows. I mean, you know, you sort of instantly call to mind like Salinger, you know, or, or stuff like that. Right. So I think some people have literary inspiration and, and for me, it's, it's more, I mean, obviously the, the, the nature I live in now must have some sort of influence on my state of mind. So it it must come through in the music in a certain way, but for me, landscapes and and nature, uh, painting pictures of whether they be forests or or prairies or open sky or mountains or rivers, uh, it's just, nature is the ultimate metaphor to be able to speak about your emotional landscape on the inside, uh, for myself, you know, I don't really know what other people are attempting to, to express for me. It's always, I'm not a storyteller and I'm not making stuff up and I'm not just trying to create poetry that, uh, speaks of land. To me, it's always a personal, expression of myself of my of my heart of my soul of my mind and and the the conflicts and the harmonies that that come with delving inside delving inward and uh uh you know some people are great about spilling their guts in public and about speaking in detail and perhaps too much too that's never been my gift i prefer to hide behind metaphors and and um just purge myself that way and find some sort of positive and uplifting expression of the journey and all its trials and tribulations. on the back. 
The last two albums, I think, in particular, um, albeit that As the Crow Flies was just really, really sparse, but obviously you broadened it out um, with the two that came after that. And I think um, If I Should Fall and, and Grave, they both had a, a sort of pronounced uh, Celtic influence in, in, in some of the tracks. I mean, I, I suppose it, maybe it's the, the fiddle or the violin and those drones, but they're, they're you know, uh, and St. Bridget's Cross and stuff like that. There was a, a real Celtic influence. Yeah, I, you know, that's something that's been an obsession of mine for so long. I mean, I, I um, discovering Celtic music, uh, you know, first came the mythologies and the stories, you know, and and uh, and then discovering the music and and the way it. Uh, had a certain mysticism to it. There's a certain magic inherent in it. I, I believe, I mean, it, it's, it's in that. And then to, you know, growing up a punk, of course, what do you hate? You hate whatever the, uh, mainstream folks are listening to. Like you don't like country and Western and bluegrass and the American folk music. Cause that's crap. You, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you want to make, loud angry punk music and then so you know i went on this journey as a listener from going to that and and then having my mind opened with uh you know experimental music and industrial music and folk music from it's like strange sounds from around the world whether it be tuvan throat singers or tibetan monks or middle eastern music or you know uh, then psychedelic music and coming back to England and Ireland and Scotland and finding uh, a folk tradition uh, through the psychedelic music, which was still heavy, but then then you find things like Sandy Denny and Davy Graham, Fairport Convention, and yeah, th- you start to find these this Celtic folk rock revival, and then from there you get right to the nitty gritty, and you and you discover Planksty, and you discover. Uh, chieftains and and things more obscure and and then then all of a sudden you're digging up uh primitive recordings of of uh alien pipes and 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 then for me i followed that back across the ocean and ended up back home and said okay these irish ballads immigrated into the mountains of the east eastern united states and started drinking a different style of whiskey and they changed and they morphed into what would become bluegrass and the and, Appalachian and yeah. And folk music and, and then would heavily influence what, what is the country Western ballad? And so in, in kind of chasing this balladry, you know, it, it um, uh, for me, it's this global journey and whatever, I'm not much of a player. I'm a pretty primitive, uh, guitar player and, so all these things must have just informed me over the years. And I, I hear different ways of fleshing out the music. And, and for me, at least right now, this new album, A Life Unto Itself, has been my most realized uh, attempt at kind of bringing those influences into something that sounds cohesive and as a single song cycle. That, that does make that journey, makes the sonic journey of my life just like it makes the emotional journey of my life. It was as though the sky Shimmers. 
I wanted to ask you specifically about Night of the Moon, because I, I think that's one of the best tracks you've ever written. What, what's Night of the Moon about, and why is it special? Because it clearly is a bit special. Um, the lyrics are a translated German poem uh, by the poet uh, Eichendorf. And um, I was turned on to it by, uh, by my wife, um, at the time where we were courting and uh, we were sharing poems that we liked back and forth and, and uh, that one just really spoke to me, you know, on a, on a grand level. It, it's the words are so simple yet um, they have so many different layers to it. Um, and this whole creation of this album is a very, a very self-reflective time. I mean, I, I've been ruminating over, over my entire life. Um, I didn't realize that I was writing a record about that until I heard it back. And then it all made sense because, you know, the, like I said, I, I, I piece things together in very abstract and nonlinear ways, but night of the moon being that I didn't write the words, it was more of a sonic way of expressing the grandiosity of such a simple piece of poetry. Um, and, um, musically it was my way of bringing my, what I do with harvest man into what I do with my solo work, uh, in that, can I combine the psychedelic aspects of using really fucked up and psychedelic guitars, uh, with, a singer-songwriter kind of style or, or, you know, framework. It's incredibly mystical in its delivery. Yeah, thank you. It just came about, like, literally I wrote the music one night long, several years ago. It's probably the oldest, one of the oldest musical pieces. I was getting ready to do some tour dates in Europe. And uh, I was combining uh, within the set Steve Von Till songs and Harvest Man songs and making something cohesive that would flow. And that informed some of the, the ways in which I approached this album musically. And, and that song in particular, I, until right before I finished the album, I still wasn't sure whether it belonged with Harvest Men or, or, or the song cycle. And it wasn't until I heard all the other songs that I thought, okay, this really needs to be kind of in the middle of this as, as an anchor for where all the other strange sounds might be coming from. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I was very lucky enough to see Scott um, play uh, with his acoustic, uh, just himself, really. He did a gig in Belfast some years back. And, of course, you know, there's Scott's albums. And did, did you two both kind of come to this need uh, at around the same time? Or did, did, did you try it before Scott? Or did Scott try it before you? Or did it both just flourish, th- this need to get back to basics just the acoustic uh, did, did, did that happen for both of you at the same time it was pretty close i mean i think my my first album came out first but uh you know i think we were both experimenting with that um independently and unbeknownst to each other and uh uh you know once I threw it out there, I think it was, we both realized it was something that, that we needed to do to explore our own voices and, uh, put ourselves out there in in an exposed kind of humbling way. And, um, you know, we think that we're both better for it and that, uh, probably neurosis is better for it because that confidence that we've been able to gain in our voices has, has come back and informed the way that we choose to fit our voices within the beast of neurosis. Uh, it's given us a broader range of expression. Yeah. I, I think um, w- what many people mightn't realize uh, about yourself is you're actually a, a school teacher in your day job. Is that right? Yeah. So what, uh, I mean, m- many people m- might think of that beast of neurosis and, uh, and find that uh, quite an eye opening thing, uh, you know, to, to be, you know, a, a school teacher. I mean, what has your job taught you? 
patience. Um, that's probably the number one. Uh, and also that, uh, you know, growing up in the DIY punk scene and, and living, you know, your entire adult life, um, in this kind of alternative reality that is, you know, uh, our whole musical environment. Um, it's quite different to all of a sudden have to deal with things like administrations and uh, parents and uh, groups of people that are, that are, I don't know, more in the mainstream. I mean, you know, I, I get to see whatever the, the, I don't know what the, the wide range of society you have. I mean, kids from come from all different backgrounds and bring a lot of different experiences and ideas with them. And, and, uh, you learn a lot about people, you know, um, the struggles that people go through the, the struggles that, I mean, what is neurosis about, but the, the, the struggle of humanity and what it's like to be a thinking, he, feeling human being in a world full of, uh, distraction and we're you know constantly searching for the meaning and then you know when you spend a lot of your time with young people some of which who have yet to have to be thrown into any sort of um, situation to worry or contemplate those type of things and still have a lot of innocence and the, the opposite end of the spectrum where they've seen way too much um I just think a lot of empathy, you know, like patience, empathy, compassion. Um, See, there was a reason I asked, uh, and the reason I asked is that, uh, you know, both with neurosis and, and with particularly, I suppose, as the crow flies, I mean, people used to bandy this word about uh, regarding you some years back. You know, they used to use this word like, you know, a sort of shaman, you know, or shamanistic kind of uh character um you know um and i did wonder you know was the point of your solo music slightly to sort of bequeath a bit of wisdom in much the same way that being a teacher is probably more to search for it than to offer any i'm not i'm not sure i have any to offer i'm always looking for some <laughs> yeah you know, uh, that's always the quest. I, I, and you know, the finding the shamanistic nature of, of people has happened to me. I mean, you know, sometimes I wish I could live in the, in the cave in the mountains farther out, farther out than I already do. And, you know, leave the responsibilities behind in order to totally dive in and, and go to those inner places without need for restraints, you know. Monday through Friday, um, or running a record label or any of those types of things. But I think music has taught me how to surrender to forces greater than oneself and how to let things flow through without the filter, without letting you, the bullshit of the world and the, the, the garbage in your mind uh, tamper with it, you know. Um, to take you somewhere else, to allow you to leave your body and allow you to have some sort of experience that's outside of yourself and that you can learn from.
What an intriguing guy, and it really is an intriguing album. It's called A Life Unto Itself, and uh, it's, it's a tremendous spin. It really is fantastic, particularly, as we've said all along, for those late nights, those late long nights. So that's it for this episode of the Metal Ireland podcast. I'm Earl Grey. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for supporting MetalIreland.com. I'll see all of you guys over at the forums, and I'll see you on the next podcast. Over and out. <laughs>